Good evening, everybody. Christopher Lamercy is my name. I'm the Director of Continuing Legal Education at the Faculty of Law here at the University of New South Wales. And it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to our talk from Professor Deborah Davis, who is a very honoured and special guest. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Deborah here on behalf of the Law School. Deborah is going to very kindly give us an update on where the research is in this important area. So if I could ask you to make Deborah welcome once more, we'll start. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. And I want to especially thank Karen Lemussier. Uh, Karen has uh, been an inspiration to many of you here. She's a new inspiration to me. And without her leadership, I would not be here this evening. So thank you, Karen, for all that you've done. Now, this evening, I'm going to talk with you about mobile devices and health. Uh, what do we know? What don't we know? And what do we do in the meantime? Uh, just for those of you who may not know, I've, I've been around a long time. And I've been in science a long time. And quite frankly, I worked at the US National Academy of Sciences and uh, not to say that scientists are arrogant or anything, but when I first heard that there might be a problem with cell phones, I did not believe it because I figured that if there were a problem, I would know about it. And I think that's the attitude of many scientists when they first hear about this issue. Uh, but then my first grandchild was born and I became very interested in what we really know about the developing brain. I had previously worked for the CDC on the lead advisory committee and I was keenly aware that the rapidly growing brain of the embryo, the fetus, and the newborn is one of the most phenomenal things we have in the living world. It more than doubles in growth in the first year of life. We go to great lengths to protect the developing brain. It's not at all myelinated. Myelin is a protective fatty sheath that grows around neurons. The young brain is exquisite and vulnerable. With that in mind, when my first grandson was able to find a cell phone and turn it on at age nine months, <coughs> At first, like every grandparent, I was very proud of this brilliant little baby. He literally could find a phone and turn it on when it was off and find a game to play. So I began to look at this more and more seriously. And the more I looked, the more concerned I became. And I realized that a lot of what I thought I knew as a scientist was wrong. In tonight's presentation, because you are a law school and I'm very fortunate to be here, to talk with you about some of the legal issues, I'm going to focus on current laws and customs, as well as what do we know about who is at risk, what's the problem, what's the evidence on sperm damage, pregnancy, and honeybees, what are some business opportunities that come about from this, and finally, what are the global policy responses that are happening now? Now, the first thing you have to realize is that every single one of the world's almost 7 billion phones today has been tested with standards that are almost 20 years old. Would you like to fly in an airplane with safety standards that are 20 years old? Or drive a car that comply to 20-year-old safety standards? But we are, in fact, using those standards for all of the phones today. Those are based on a 220-pound male with almost a 12-pound head. He didn't talk a lot. Six minutes, average call. And none of this considers anything except how to avoid heating the brain there's no consideration that there are effects that have nothing to do with heat, some of which I'm going to show you this evening. Now, one of the most important things to think about from a policy point of view is that the world's secondary insurance market does not cover health damages from wireless devices. The telecom industry is the world's largest right now, and they self-insure, and they can afford to. But secondary insurers for more than 10 years have not covered health damages from wireless devices. And at the end of my talk, I'm going to show you some of the 10K forms that are now filed by companies to their shareholders, explaining what their current understanding of their own liabilities are. But here's a big one. Swiss Re said in 2014 that the risk from dangers linked to EMF is comparable to the risk from asbestos or mad cow disease. Now, if we talk about the spectrum for electromagnetic radiation, it goes all the way from the things that turn on these light switches here 
to cosmic and X-rays that are completely invisible and we know are quite harmful. There's no question about it. The term microwave is actually not a scientific word. In fact, I'll tell you how it got coined. In the 1970s, microwave ovens were invented, but they weren't called microwave ovens. They were called radar ranges. Because the guys that invented them thought it was pretty cool to cook with radar. Well, they didn't exactly fly off the shelves when they were first marketed. And uh, so they figured they needed a more feminine term than radar range. And that's how they came up with the term microwave oven. Sounds kind of pleasant, doesn't it? Well, the microwave spectrum includes that for the oven as well as the cell phone, the mobile phone, the baby monitor, the garage door opener. The difference in all of those devices is their power. The microwave oven uses about 1,000 watts of power. The cell phone uses less than one. And it was believed by many physicists that the cell phone radiation was too weak in power to have any biological effect. That turns out to have been a mistaken belief. And it turns out that the most important thing we need to know about this radiation, is that cell phones are not continuous signals. They are erratic. And that kind of signaling over thousands of minutes, over many months, over many years, for our children and the rest of us, has biological effects. We think that it weakens membranes. It increases heat shock proteins. It increases reactive oxygen species. These are things that we know are markers of risk and damage, biochemical indications that there is a risk developing, an inflammation, if you will. These are things that respond, that develop in response to the sense that the body is being attacked in some way and needs to defend itself or repair itself. So cell phones emit pulsed radiation. And just to give you some idea of what that looks like, this is an image from my colleagues in Greece, and it shows you that the pulse signal, and you can see that there's frequency, there's amplitude, and we think very important is the amount of information content on these uh, signals. All of these variables are important. Now, there's a literature on this where studies are done that claim there's no effect, and often those studies will use a continuous wave instead of a pulsed wave. There are other problems in inconsistent studies. Sometimes they'll use adult cells instead of neuronal stem cells from uh, newborns. And depending on the cell you use, the type of signal you use, you can get very different results. And if you don't understand the importance of these things, it will look as though the evidence shows you that there's no effect when, in fact, you've picked the wrong thing to study. And as I will make clear, sometimes that's not an accident. This is just to show you what happens in a four-second phone call. This is volts per meter. We call it power density. Now, the worst time for you to pick up a phone and put it next to your head is when you say hello. Phones are smart. They go to max power. When you say hello, have the phone out here. Never keep it next to your head. And notice that it goes up and down in power density. This is four seconds of a phone call. That's all over and over again, this kind of exposure is highly problematic to membranes of our cells. And we think that this may be part of the reason why we're getting responses, biological responses, to this relatively weak radiation. It's not the power. In fact, the newest phones have the lowest power. But it looks like the 3G technology is more toxic than the 2G, is measured by different indicators that we use. Now, 2D modeling, we've had two-dimensional modeling of this exposure, has been around for almost 20 years. In 1996, my colleague Om Gandhi of the University of Utah was chairman of the Department of Electrical Engineering and president of the Bioelectromagnetic Society. And he published these findings, which is a scalar two-dimensional model showing the relative amount of radiation in the large head and the smallest head. He lost all his funding for research from Motorola when he published it. But he continued to do the work that he was doing. And in 2002, he produced this work showing a more anatomically based modeling of the amount of absorption. And you can see on the right side the smallest head, of course, 
absorbs proportionally more radiation than the largest head. This is basic, makes basic sense. But still, it was two-dimensional modeling. My colleagues in Brazil and I are now working on three-dimensional modeling. And we're doing this using um, software that's been specially designed and is currently used to evaluate medical devices uh, for the FDA and for all the relative, uh, relevant agencies that do that. And you can see here, and I'm sorry, I don't have a, a pointer, so the bottom is the big guy head. We call that guy SAM. That's short for Standard Anthropomorphic Mannequin. SAM is this big guy. And you can see there is absorption into the big guy brain. It's a little difficult to tell here, but there is greater absorption into the eight-year-old. But this is what we need to be dealing with right now. People are giving phones to children as toys. There's an explosive growth in apps. I think it's really worthwhile to note that Steve Jobs did not let his children play with these things. And when I've talked to the Silicon Valley Health Institute in a room of, with several hundred people and asked, how many of you would give your five-year-old an iPad? Not one hand went up. And they send their children to the Waldorf schools, which do not use computers in elementary school. So there's really an awareness among some of the IT community that you want to be careful about introducing this technology to the young brain. Let me show you one example. And I think uh, we will go out here to find the YouTube. Is that right? Let's see. Glad you have a sense of humor. It helps in this field. It goes a long way, because some of the things that happen are not funny at all. And I'm, this is a true story. I talked to another grandmother whose grandchild will not go to the potty without the iPad. There is an iPotty, and it comes with apps to teach the child how to use the potty. So this child literally will not go to the potty without the iPad. Uh, I know a number of men who have that problem, too. <laughs> But the idea that we're going to put a two-way microwave device right in front of the brain of these young children while they are, in fact, learning about their bodies and needing to relate to the cues of proprioception and around them from people who care about them, the idea that we will try to let technology take over the most intimate parts of our lives, that's something that we really need to have a more serious conversation about. Yes, there's the eye bouncy chair I just showed you. There is an eye potty. There's a teething rattle case for the iPad and the iPhone. Now, Silicon Valley inventors of these things don't use them. And it's people who have the resources available to do this that will spend the money on such things. I'm going to show you now why that's a very bad idea. Uh, this is a modeling of 3D exposure in the brain developed by colleagues at the Swiss National Institute of Technology, ITIS. And here you can see in their model, there's greater absorption into the eye, this side as well. This is a, 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 a less sophisticated model than what I'm going to show you next. Um, this is a more complex model of the pregnant abdomen. And the highest exposure to the child's brain and spinal cord occurs in the latest part of pregnancy because the microwave radiation gets directly through the skin. So you can see here, this, this is the spinal cord and the head are right close to the surface, greatest exposure. Now, here's, um, sorry. Oh, that's the iPotty. There it is. And that's what babies do when you give them phones, put them in their mouths. Um, we'll see if this, look at this. We'll do it again, a three-year-old. Yeah. 
This is new modeling that we've just completed, done with the Federal University of Brazil in Porto Alegre, and Environmental Health Trust. Goodness. Say again. Oh, so let's stay away from that. OK. Uh, this is the three-year-old. And I want you to look at the brain. You see, of course, the highest exposure here. Um, the eyes, it gets almost all the way through. All right? And this is a 34-year-old. And the exposure is highest just in the cheek, the eye, the ear. But relatively less exposure relatively less exposure into the head. Now, I should, this modeling has never before been done. When we first started out to do this work uh, four years ago, I asked my colleagues if it could be done, because we had it's one millimeter voxels, and we had really important programming issues and software to deal with. And they said to me, why would anybody want to model exposure into a child's head? That was four years ago. Unfortunately, I think you all know now why we need to do this. Because people are assuming everything's fine until we have evidence that we are in the middle of a disaster. And we can't afford to continue to carry on public policy based on the demand for proof of human harm before taking steps to prevent harm from unfolding. So now I'm going to share with you some experimental studies of wireless radiation in pregnancy and I'm going to give you a summary of a few studies, from which there are many others, produced by the laboratory of Gazi University, the laboratory of biophysics. And I want to say Turkey has very sophisticated research in this field, because as a NATO country, they also live and die by radar. And so that's why they've had a longstanding tradition of doing research in biophysics, unlike many other countries where research in this field has been very limited and with very limited financial support. This is a study where they exposed the rabbits during pregnancy to a GSM, that's the current types of phones most of you use, radiation for 15 minutes a day for seven days. It's not a lot of exposure, but it's about a third of the pregnancy. And the control groups are here. Now, this is a measure of DNA damage called 8-hydroxyguanine addicts. But basically, <clears throat> it's important to understand we all get DNA damage all the time. We all get cancer in some sense all the time. But the cells don't proliferate because we have repair. We drink green tea. We eat things containing other antioxidants. We sleep in the dark. And all of those things help to repair damage naturally. So you will have DNA damage from being alive. Oxygen and sunlight, for example, cause them. But what you see here is the control groups have half as much DNA damage, uh, almost, as the exposed. And so you get significantly greater DNA damage with a little bit of exposure during pregnancy. And I'm showing you this one study, and there are many others. This is, uh, again, um, the measure of uh, liver malonaldehyde. And here you see the control groups, another measure of DNA damage, and significantly more damage here. And I should point out that this is not a zero scale. So it's not that it's really double. This, if, if this, this would be here, the difference here is more like about 30% between the controls and the exposed in terms of DNA damage. Now, there's other research that has looked at prenatal effects and specifically measured brain and testis, measuring a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is rather essential to learning and memory and impulse control, and showing significant effects. This was published in the journal Brain Research, showing effects on the dentate gyrus of rats after exposure to 900 megahertz for 60 minutes a day uh, throughout gestation, which is 21 days for a rodent. So an hour a day for 21 days for rodents produce significant evidence of damage in their brains. Here you see the exposed, and here you see the controls. And you see 
fewer cells, and they are more irregular. Since this is not a medical audience, I'm not going to make more comments on this, but the fact of the matter is there's stereological analysis that can show you where the cells should form and how they should form. And what we find from this work is that there is, the cells are missing and they're abnormal in their shape. Uh, this is a different study done in, in um, Greece where newborns were exposed shortly after birth. Now what we do in animal research is sometimes we'll starve the rodent in order to teach them to run a maze for a food reward. Kind of how, like, I feel sometimes running for lunch. You know you really will do almost anything to get something to eat when you're hungry. And rats will learn how to find their way out of a maze if they're starving. What this study did is they took these rats that had already learned to run the maze, and then they exposed them to RF. And they found that the ones were ex that were exposed took three times as long to find their way to food. And they made twice as many errors. More errors and longer to get to food. Now, it's interesting about this. A study was just published today on memory in adolescence from the Swiss research group. I didn't have time to put it in this, this lecture. And they followed a group of adolescents prospectively, which is rather important, and looked at their cell phone use reported and found significant effects on their memory of the kids who were the heaviest cell phone users over time. And uh, this is, of course, a very important finding. It's consistent with the animal research. Unless you think these, this is only animals and it can't be relevant to us, I want you to think about something. Every drug you've ever taken has been tested in an animal. That's what we do. We test drugs in animals. We see how they respond. And then we go on to test them in people. So if you can use animals to test drugs, you ought to be able to use animals to test the way they respond to environmental factors. And yet we often hear when we have these kinds of results, well, that's rats and ro rodents doesn't really apply to us. But in fact, we differ from rodents in our genome by maybe 1%. That's what we now know. Now, I'm going to show you some experimental studies on mobile phone exposed human sperm. And again, these studies have often just taken uh, an aliquot, samples of sperm from healthy men, and one test tube gets exposed to cell phone radiation, and one does not. Now, normally, sperm are going to die. They're not meant to live in a test tube. But look at these results. This is from Sir John Aitken, a Newcastle laureate professor. And what he has shown here. This is the count of sperm. How vital are they? How well can they swim? How mobile moat are they? We measure, there are detailed scales for measuring these characteristics of sperm. Now, to make one healthy baby, you need a, ideally a half a billion sperm. Sperm count is falling all over the world today, long before mobile phones were used. There are many different causes of this decline. One may well be some pesticides and chemicals, endocrine disruptors, xenoestrogens, other things. But one of the factors contributing to the current reduction in sperm count certainly could be mobile phone radiation. And the reason we can say that is that this work shows that there's three times more DNA damage seen here in the bottom. This is DNA damage in exposed sperm than in controls. Why do you need? a half a billion sperm to make one healthy baby. Because sperm don't know how to ask for directions. <laughs> Actually, they do have a tough job. They've got to swim the equivalent of from Los Angeles to Hawaii. Really, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a hard job. And you, you need the healthiest to survive, to succeed. And that is, that's, that's quite uh, a challenge. So we need to understand what's going on here. And this study that I've showed you here has been replicated a number of times in other labs, in China, in Saudi Arabia, in Turkey. The Cleveland Clinic has also shown similar results. And these are with human sperm. 
So the idea that you only have one off study on this issue and we can therefore, the rest should be dismissed is of course makes no sense. This is a literature that really needs to be taken into account. When I spoke to the Canadian Parliament Standing Committee on Health a few months ago, they looked at this, this new evidence as well as others and have concluded that there really needs to be a national public education program to give people the right to know about what we now understand about these risks. And I'll return to that at, by the end of my talk. This is the Cleveland Clinic data from Ashok Agarwal, who has published more than 400 articles. And what he found, very interesting observation in 2008, was that the men who carried their devices and wore them the most, four hours a day or more, had the lowest sperm count. Here you see, sorry, the scale. This is the lower sperm count. Those who reported relatively no use had the highest sperm count. And these were men who came to the Cleveland Clinic for fertility problems. And he started to notice that the ones with the biggest fertility problems sometimes were like I used to be. They wore their, gun, their um, phones like guns, you know, gunslingers. And they had direct contact with their body with these devices. Now, Yale University has contributed some other important animal studies, also consistent with the work that's been previously produced in Turkey and recently replicated. They looked at prenatally exposed mice in terms of behavior. Now for behavior of rodents, we have standard scales. We measure anxiety, we measure fear, we measure, measure levels of activity, we measure appropriate mating behavior. And these are standard ways to measure animals. Anybody here an animal researcher? Right? So, all right. Well, I will explain that this particular study, which was published in a Nature publication, Scientific Reports, actually looked at a GSM phone mounted at the water bottle of the cage. So that's not a lot of exposure, because distance was kept. And Dr. Taylor, who was a lead author on this, told me that it was weird because the animals, although the lab techs were not supposed to know which cages had exposure and which cages had a sham phone, the animals clearly liked to hang out around the phones that were on. They were attracted to it. They're, now we know that they actually bind with the opioid receptors, right? Heroin binds with the opioid receptors. Other things that may be good for us to do as well. The pleasure center of the brain can be triggered by this. What he found was that if you looked at pregnant mice and controls throughout gestation, which is 21 days, significant effects on memory, hyperactivity, and anxiety. These mice had poor memory, they had more activity, and they had more anxiety, but they had no fear, <laughs> right? Other studies have shown for humans exposed to cell phone radiation that they have faster reaction time and they make more mistakes. So you're quicker and you make more errors. Think about that the next time you're driving. You can go faster, but you might be making more mistakes if you've had this kind of exposure. Now, we don't want to make too much of the animal studies, but again, I want to tell you, this is not the only study with these findings. There are similar studies showing effects, and as a consequence of that, Professor Taylor, who is the chairman of obstetrics and gynecology at Yale University Medical School, has issued a general recommendation to every pregnant woman that walks into that Yale New Haven Medical Center to avoid exposing the pregnant abdomen to mobile phone radiation. Martha Herbert of Harvard Medical School has looked at the literature on autistic spectrum and has concluded that the current evidence is sufficient to warrant new public exposure standards benchmarked to non-thermal exposure levels. And she's written this in a letter to the FCC, and she's published an article, a review article in the peer-reviewed journal to this effect. So you've got some very eminent people now who have concluded that we have reasons for concern based on learning and impact on the developing brain. 
Now, it's also important to realize that in, in four years ago, the World Health Organization brought together some of the foremost experts in the world, and they concluded that at that time, evidence indicated that mobile phone radiation was a possible human carcinogen. The working group, when it released its report, the director of the IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, said, it's important that additional research be conducted, but pending such information, it's important to take pragmatic measures to reduce exposure, such as hand-free devices or texting. That's the advice of the World Health Organization in 2011. I have published an article since then with colleagues who are, as I have been, an advisor to the World Health Organization. And we have concluded that the current evidence says that cell phone radiation is a human carcinogen, a probable human carcinogen, and not just a possible human carcinogen. OK, so how many possible or probable carcinogens do you think children should be playing with? DDT, lead? Engine exhaust? Maybe they should get a shot of whiskey occasionally? All of those things we know to be hazardous. We would never give our children something that might cause cancer, except that we are giving millions of children around the world today access to devices that may increase their cancer risk. Now, the cancer risk is highly problematic because it takes a long time to be sure of the cancer. When I was at the US National Academy of Sciences, one of the first projects we worked on was passive smoke in airplanes. Some of you are not old enough to know that you used to be able to smoke on airplanes. And it was not very pleasant. And we did the research to show that in the course of an eight hour flight, the amount of smoke on an airplane in the smoking section and the non-smoking section became identical, as measured as ultrafine particulate air pollution. It didn't take long to do the study, but it took four years to publish it. Four years. And that's the world in which we live right now. That was tobacco. Now on mobile phone radiation and brain cancer, the International Agency for Research on Cancer completed their study in 2005. And as I was completing my book, uh, Disconnect, writing the chapter, calling on them to release the study, they released the study. It took five years to release a study that had been completed. Five years. And the reason for that was because of the intense fights among the authors about exactly how to frame their results, which in fact did show a statistically significant increased risk in brain cancer in the highest users of mobile phones. It does show that, and that finding has become more robust now. French national studies, work from Hardell, all confirming wherever you have someone with long-term use of mobile phone radiation, 10 years or more, you've got between a 50% to eight-fold increased risk of malignant brain cancer, glioma. So where are we now? The glioma risk is very consistent. These are the recent studies since Interphone, uh, Hardell and Serenot, which is the French national study. And what this, these numbers mean is this. After 10, more, 10 years or more of exposure, you have about a 1.8-fold increased risk overall and, uh, and 1.6-fold in Serenot. But if you look more carefully at the heaviest users for the longest time, the risk numbers go up. The risk numbers go up. Now, brain cancer is a rare disease, but it's not one anyone wants to get. And even if it doubled, it might not make a huge impact on our society right away. But if we know something can increase the risk of brain cancer, I think we have to take steps to reduce that risk. I'm often asked, why don't we have an increased risk of brain cancer today? After all, everybody's using a mobile phone. Well, hang on a second. Brain cancer takes a long time to develop. How do we know that? When the bombs fell at the end of World War II, the survivors were followed, and there's still some of them alive now, to see what kinds of cancers they developed. 
there was no increase in brain cancer in those survivors until 40 years had passed. 40 years. That's the latency for brain cancer in a general population. Your use of cell phones today is radically different than it was three years ago. You get free call time, unlimited calls. You didn't have unlimited calls five years ago. So your use of phones is radically changed. And you're looking for an effect of brain cancer? That's the wrong question to ask in the general population. It's not going to show up in the general population for many years. But what we do know, if you try to study it with a case control design where you take people who have brain cancer, who are socioeconomically similar to others who do not have the disease, and you study them in great detail, which is what the Interphone study did and what other studies have done, you find no increase in brain cancer when you do that kind of work. No increase at all. If you have average exposures of six years, seven years, which most studies published did have, but if you take a look at every well-designed case control study with heaviest exposures, they all find that after 10 years of heavy exposure, you get a significant increase in brain cancer. Now, you want to wait to get more data if every study is showing you this. And then what Hardell has done is he's got a few people with 25 years of exposure. And yes, they were exposed to the older technologies. And yes, the older technologies were hotter and did have uh, potentially more damaging uh, conditions. But the fact of the matter is we are seeing this increase in brain cancer. And there's someone I'm going to introduce you here this evening who knows about it very well. Now I want to share with you some slides from my colleagues in India, from the Indian Council of Medical Research, where they are doing very detailed studies. India and Israel are two high-tech countries that are very actively studying this problem. Most other countries, including Australia and the United States, have almost no serious financial investment in studying the question of radiofrequency radiation and its impact on health. In fact, whatever money is spent is spent to advance the technology and its spread rather than to develop innovations in hardware and software to reduce exposure or evaluate its potential impact on the population. These are studies that they've done on the honeybee. Now, there are many different causes of colony collapse disorder, which is a worldwide phenomenon. As a result of it, people are sending trucks around with beehives to fertilize crops because there aren't enough honeybees. In the United States, they're doing this. In Australia, they're doing this as well. Among the factors that could account for the decline in honeybees, of course, are nicotinoid pesticides and other pesticides that have been identified as, as factors. But one of the factors could be mobile phone radiation. And we know that because studies have clarified dance patterns of bees. I am not an expert in this. I'm relaying the data from my Indian colleagues. They have different kinds of dance, the waggle, the shacking, and the treble. And they're all relevant to making honey. This one study took control hives and test hives. And after 10 days of exposure, all the workers returned to the control hives. And very few workers returned to the test hives. And the queen, who can't move because she's so big, was there with a few eggs. But the hives were no longer making honey. After 10 days and 10 minutes of cell phone radiation, worker bees did not return to test colonies. It's not just one study. I want to make this clear. There are other studies indicating this problem. Wait. Honey bees, Einstein once said, are essential to civilization. And we know that's true. This is certainly a very worrisome finding, and one that ought, ought to make us think, this isn't just a question of whether or not we have an epidemic of brain cancer. This is a question of life on Earth, of all forms of life. So why do we have so many inconsistent results? We do. Why are there so many studies that find nothing? Well, first of all, as Seinfeld would say, 
it is complicated. It's truly complicated. There's many different cells that can be studied. You can take adult lymphocytes and neural stem cells, and they're not comparable, and you can do the same kinds of exposure and get very different results. You can get different exposures. You can have continuous waves versus pulsed exposures. And there are differences with frequencies. But frankly, we have to acknowledge that most of the research that's been done in this field has been sponsored by industry. And while I know good and honest people who work in industry, it's also the case that many people have shaded their results to suit those who have supported it. Or he who pays the piper calls the tune. Or where you stand on an issue depends on where you sit and who bought your chair. And that's especially the case when it comes to this kind of research. We don't have enough of it, and what we do have is heavily influenced by the sources of funding that exist. That's why I've called for a two cents a fee device, a two cents fee on every device, on every manufacturer, on every user, and on every provider for a period of five years. That would, in fact, given all the devices we have nowadays, generate the funds that we need for research and training. We desperately need to train people in this field of bioelectromagnetics, in medicine and electromagnetics, electrical engineering. And it would also create the major public education program that has been started in Israel and India, and I'm going to show you some of those in a moment. Here's what happened in France in 2010. They passed a law that bans advertising to young children and requires all cell phones be sold with earpieces and labeling of the SAR on phones and restrictions and warnings to all users. That's France. The Canadian Parliamentary Health Committee that I testified before with Dr. Martha Herbert and others concluded that the current test system needs to be updated and the public needs to be educated about risks. They said that the modeling of the total head absorption is inaccurate and uses homogeneous liquid. Your brain is so complex, it doesn't have one kind of liquid in it, like the model currently uses. It has very different densities of the material. The dielectric constant of the air is one. The dielectric constant of a child's brain is about 80. The dielectric constant of my brain is about 40. The dielectric constant is, tells you how much you can absorb the radiation. The more fluid in a brain, the thinner the skull, the more radiation it will absorb. We know that to be the case, and yet we're using a model with homogeneous liquid that does not take into account that we're really concerned about the dose at the brain, not the exposure, but the dose. You can be exposed to sunlight. The dose will depend on whether you've used sunscreen. We've got to be more sophisticated. We have the tools to do it. We have to use them. We have to take into account the developmental immaturity of the young brain. And the Canadian Parliamentary Committee said that microwave radiation is now a serious public health issue. That's their position. Now, I want to share with you, since this is a group of legal people, how many of you are attorneys or associated with attorneys, just for my information? You, right? All right, yes. In the United States today, there's a court case working its way through the system representing about 12 men with brain cancer. Some of the cases I've known personally developed brain cancer at age 28, age 32, and they were the first users of the technology. And they were on it 24-7 and collapsed in spasms at age 28, 32, with a malignant brain cancer. And those folks are dead. There's a lawsuit being put together on behalf of a number of them, alleging that mobile phone radiation caused their brain cancer. And the court has recently issued this ruling, which has been upheld so far, saying if there is even a reasonable possibility that cell phone radiation is carcinogenic, the time for action in the public health and regulatory sectors is upon us. If the probability of carcinogenicity is low, 
but the magnitude of the potential harm is high. Good public policy dictates that the risk should not be ignored. Now, what's happened in California? The city of Berkeley, for more than five years, has been considering a right to know statute. How many of you have iPhones? Hands, please. Good, we're going to do a show and tell right now. Would you please take them out and put it on airplane mode? You understand why in a moment. And go to settings. And when you get there, get to settings, raise your hand so I'll know. And share with others so that people can look on, please. OK. Now, from settings, you go to general. Right? It's about seven down on the front screen. All right, raise your hand when you got there. General? OK, good. And from general, you go to the top to about. Now, from, about, from there, you go all the way down to something you don't even know is there called legal. And then when you click on legal, click on RF exposure. And there it is. There it is. It tells you to reduce exposure to RF radiation, use the hands-free device or the headset provided with this. Right? It's there. You should know about it. You've been warned. So in response to these hidden warnings, the city of Berkeley passed the cell phone right to know ordinance unanimously. And that law requires cell phone retailers to provide you with a fact sheet so that before you buy the phone, you find out that you can't put it in your pocket. You cannot keep a phone in your pocket without exceeding the as-tested exposure guidelines. That's the fact. Operating cell phones will exceed the as-tested exposure guidelines unless they're on airplane mode, in which case they're neither sending nor receiving microwave radiation. Now, how many of you who are new to this issue knew that this was here before? Oh, this is an informed audience, OK? So the city of Berkeley passed this law, and then industry sued. They sued. They said, you're violating our First Amendment rights. You can't force us to tell you what's buried in the phone, because that's a violation of our free speech. You're compelling us to tell you something that we don't want to tell you. They sued, and the person they had representing them then was the former Solicitor General of the United States, because they can afford to hire those kind of people. The person we had defending the right to know was Harvard professor Lawrence Lessig and Yale Law School dean Robert Post. They went to defend the city, and guess what? The right to know so far has survived. It has survived. I believe that on Australia, you have similar rights. And I hope that you'll be able to make some headway now on that issue. But this is the message that Telstra is now sending people. A service message comes about every couple weeks. Whoops. The uh, advice that was in there isn't showing up. But when you, when you go to it, it tells you what the tips are to save energy. There it is. Uh, you click on that link, and I'll show you those in a minute. Now, I think it's great that Telstra is doing this. It's wonderful. You might want to know why they're doing it. It's a good question. You might want to ask whether they should do a little more. Because after all, you get a text message. Are you going to click on that? Most people don't have the time. Now, we are doing the Baby Safe Project as one way to inform people with Yale University and over 100 physicians and experts around the world to promote precautions during pregnancy. But I want to show you what the companies are doing. Vodafone, I think it's a company you're familiar with. In the United States, there's a Form 20F or a Form 10K that legally must be filled out every year by companies. And they are obligated to report on any risks and liabilities that they face. Legally, they have to report. 
So I'm going to show you a few of these, because I, I can't go through all of them. But you will see that Vodafone has said, we have risks uh, from health, although the World Health Organization agree there is no evidence that convinces experts that exposure to radio frequency fields from mobile devices operated within guideline limits has any adverse health effects. Well, that's actually not correct. The World Health Organization actually says there's limited evidence and we need more research. These guys are saying a change to this view could result in a range of impacts from a change to national legislation, to a major reduction in mobile phone usage, or to major litigation. In fact, that's already happening. Here, the war Here is the 10K report from Verizon. It says, we are subject to a significant amount of litigation which could require us to pay significant damages or settlements. They're reporting this. AT&T, unfavorable litigation or governmental investigation results could require us to pay significant amounts. They face liabilities, corporate liabilities. This is what they are reporting uh, because they're required to do so. This is China Mobile. We cannot be certain that future studies will not impute a link between electromagnetic fields and adverse health effects. Well, guess what? We can be sure that they will, because there is a link. And that link is strong and getting stronger now. And all of these demurers and these 10K forms and 424B3 forms, all of which are filed quite recently, they all say we cannot be sure that additional studies will not demonstrate a link between radio frequency emissions and health concerns. Of course there's a link. Why don't we do something about it? Why don't we work together to reduce exposures, to come up with better software and better hardware? Actually, there's a Chinese company called Chihu that is making a router that has a baby safe mode. It's a router that automatically goes off when it's not used and goes to the lowest power possible. You could have cordless phones like they have in Switzerland that are only on when, they, when you need them. You could have routers that turn themselves off when they're not being used. You could design software and hardware for operating systems of, of phones that would not work 900 times a minute to ping to the tower saying, where are you, here I am, where are you, here I am. That's how phones are set up to work. They are smart. What if the operating system didn't go 900 times a minute, but 90 times a minute? What would that do to your operating function? We have some engineers here. I'd like to ask them what they think would happen if we were to try to make that change. You could substantially reduce the demand on the network. Now, the American Tower Corporation says, we do not maintain any significant insurance. That's where <clears throat> the, ru the rubber hits the road. And I won't go through any more of these. This is from South America, Telefonica. But they're all acknowledging that there's risk. There is a legal responsibility of these corporations to report to the Securities and Exchange Commission that they face risks because there may be risks associated with their products and their services. T-Mobile. The wireless handset emissions may interfere with various electronic medical devices. By the way, in the old days, they interfered with pacemakers, and they caused deaths. Those were the old days, of course. And the solution to this, by the way, was very interesting. They fixed the pacemakers to have more insulation on the wires. Right. Now, this is what's happening in Oman. Yes, Oman. Graphic artists are designing ways to get messages to people. Here's one of them. It's a little busy, but it's a stop sign. It says prevention is better than cure. You betcha prevention is better than cure. Do you know what it costs to treat a brain cancer just in the first two years that the person survives? In the United States, it's more than half a million dollars, easily. And that's just the medical costs that does not deal with the terrible human burden of this disease on the patient, on their family, and on the rest of us who have to deal with the consequences. 
which are far more than economic for anybody dealing with that kind of disease. So here's what Canada has done. They have a bill to reduce exposure, and they give practical advice. This is the Canadian health authorities. This is what they say. Limit the length of cell phone calls. Replace cell phone calls with text. And encourage children under the age of 18 to limit their cell phone usage. This is the National Government of Canada. And there's a bill that's been put forward in the Parliament to require information and awareness about the risks of cell phone radiation. Now, at this point, I think I'd like to stop my remarks, and I want to call on someone that's a great honor for me to invite up here, and I hope you understand what a rare privilege it is for me and for all of you to be able to hear from Professor Dr. Charlie Teo, who is one of the world's most distinguished and renowned neurosurgeons. Dr. Teo, would you please join me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. We met for the first time last night, and we talked about the right to know and what's happened in California. And Dr. Teo told me, as many of you may know, that he's been involved in this issue for a long time. Perhaps you can share with us some of your observations about what you think is lying behind the brain cancer patterns now and what you think Australia could be doing on the right to know. Well, thank you, Deborah. It's, uh, thanks for the lovely introduction. I feel very humbled here. <clears throat> well, you know, there's a lot that I don't know, and obviously I didn't know many of the things that you taught us tonight, but uh, there's a lot that I do know. And being a specialist in brain cancer, I can tell you that brain cancer is a terrible cancer, like you alluded to. It's, uh, it's the number one cancer killer in children. It kills more children than any other disease, and it kills more young adults than any other cancer. And you're right, it has uh, been ranked number one by all studies in developing countries as the cancer that uh, has the greatest uh, socioeconomic impact on society. <clears throat> the cost is in the billions, of course, in both your country and our country when it comes to brain cancer. That's what I do know. I also know that I had a patient who had brain cancer who was exposed to huge amounts of uh, uh, EMR from... Um, owning a transport company, he said he was on it for at least eight hours a day and so were his partners and they weren't related at all but he died of brain cancer. All four partners in the company died of brain cancer and then his wife rang us up two years after he died to say that the secretary who was also on the mobile phone died of brain cancer. So I do know that uh, if you're exposed enough to EMR you will get brain cancer and you'll die from it. Uh, I'm sure you are aware of the studies uh, showing that if you live around high tensile electrical wires, uh, these were studies out of uh, Scandinavia, but then validated by a study out of Chicago showing that you have a higher incidence of leukaemia and brain cancer if you live around high tensile wires. So we do know that, that's a fact. We also know that brain cancer is increasing in frequency. We know that is a fact. And the other thing that I think is most scary is the fact that uh, those of you who are scientists in the room would realise that statistically it takes a lot of robust... Uh, data to uh, prove, uh, well, to negate a null hypothesis. And with the Interphone study, it was designed to show that there was no link between brain cancer and mobile phone usage, but indeed it showed that there was a link uh, in those people who use their phones uh, for what they call high, high usage, which was only half an hour a day. <coughs> I also know that they excluded two very, very high risk groups, and that is children, less than 18 and corporate users of mobile phones who tend to use their phone more than other people. So I think that's unfair. And I also know that the lead author of that study uh, was upset that they didn't include children and went on to, of course, study uh, children in another study. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that we do know that are very concerning. Uh, I also know that Australia is very poor in terms of truth in labelling. Uh, I'm also a great advocate for animal welfare and uh, I'm sure you are all aware of the terrible usage of palm oil and the destruction of the habitat of orangutans to get palm oil. We simply asked the government back in 2008, 2009 to have truth in labelling so that we would know which products contained palm oil and which didn't so that the public would have a fair say in what product they used and of course that was rejected even though it had bipartisan support before a contingent of... Uh, uh, vested interest people came out from Borneo and, 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 and changed their minds. 
So uh, when it comes to mobile phones, I think Australia could take the lead. I mean, we took the lead when it came to uh, compulsory seat belt wearing, uh, compulsory helmet to bicycle helmet wearing, and we saw the major health benefits from those two uh, initiatives. So, so I'd fact, love to see, yeah, I'd love to see Australia uh, come up with a truth in labelling when it comes to mobile phones. I was going to say, this, these issues of palm oil and cell phone radiation, mobile phone radiation, share the fact that truth in labelling is what's needed. And the, you have a right to know, a uh, basic right to know is a fact essential to democracy. Democracy rests on the freely given consent of the governed to be governed. Right? You consent to be governed. And in order to consent to be exposed to mobile phone radiation, you have to know what you're being exposed to. And here you have the manufacturers putting the information deep within the operating system, and people are completely unaware of it. So I think that with your leadership and with people here in this room, such as Karen, Chris, and others, the right to know, whether it's palm oil or mobile phone radiation, ought to be heartily supported it's, it's long overdue, and I, I think the thing for me that's so exciting, is that this really is an honor to meet you, is to realize that you're a leader on that issue and that perhaps together we can do something positive on, on this one as well. Because it's clear that industry is aware you cannot keep a phone in your pocket without exceeding the as-tested guidelines. Right? You all did not know that. Right? Your heart is an electric organ. So is your brain. You want to protect them. If you have to keep a phone in your pocket, put it on airplane mode. This month's issue of Consumer Reports, a major national publication in the United States, highly respected, says nobody should keep a phone in their pocket when it's on. So maybe we can talk more with the audience here. If you have questions for Dr. Teal or me, and we'd love to talk more about my presentation. And because you are an expert on this issue, I invite you to share that stage with me. Perhaps we can. Uh, get a chair up here so we can sit together. Is that possible? Right. Thank you, Chris. Right. And I'll open it up for questions now. I have two questions. Uh, the first is that I notice we have video cameras here, and could you give some information about where we might uh, get access to the video recording of this talk uh, later on? Uh, my second question relates to something you haven't had time to talk about, I'm sure, but uh, that is uh, where can we find more information about the mechanisms that might be affecting the cells? Um, my son, one of my sons who's a research scientist, says statistics is what you do when you've got no idea how something works. Uh, I think that's true <laughs> to some extent, and maybe you can't have such an idea, but can we get access? Uh, could you just put, give us a reference to sources where the actual mechanisms of what's going on might uh, be added to the marvellous amount of information you've given us? So first of all, where can we get access to this video recording, and uh, can we get further information about some other aspects of the problem. Chris, do you know the answer about the video? Um, the Yes, I will. Second. Two questions. Well, wait. There is a second part of the question about mechanisms, and I'd like to address it very briefly. Um, first, let me say that as someone who's a cancer epidemiologist, the mechanisms question is very difficult to answer, and we still don't fully understand the mechanism by which tobacco causes cancer. We know that it has within it over 2,000 chemicals, some of which can directly damage DNA. Asbestos causes cancer. We all know that. But guess what? it doesn't directly damage DNA. It's what we call an epigenetic carcinogen. So there are, cancer is a complex of many different diseases. That's number one. 
and we don't fully understand the mechanism for many things that we accept are associated with poor health, tobacco and asbestos being two examples. So often, the question of mechanism is thrown up as a red herring. You don't have any mechanism, forget it. There's no problem. Well, let me tell you, there are studies suggesting this is interfering with calcium transport. It affects um, drugs that are designed to enhance calcium transport. So that's one very essential mechanism to every cell in the body. There is suggestion that it increases heat shock proteins, reactive oxygen species, and I don't want to bore this non-technical audience with a bunch of things. You can find some of that information on our website, ehtrust.org, and on other, there's a website managed by the German government called emfportal.de, and it has a complete list. It's one of the most uh, complete sources that I know of. The reality is this is the kind of research that should be supported by major national and international efforts. And the, work, the Chinese have a proverb, a way of looking is a way of not looking. And we've been not looking, just like the Interphone study was designed not to find something, but did find something. We've been not looking at this issue for a long time. And I believe we, we've really reached a tipping point now because of people like you who are here this evening who are going to see that the policies change on the right to know about palm oil, about mobile phone radiation, and move forward the much needed research that we do need in this field. There's yes. one also really interesting phenomenon that uh, I think you'll find uh, quite fascinating. That is that we do, there's many, there's many, uh, there's a lot of speculation about what causes brain cancer, but there's only one real uh, carcinogen that's uh, well accepted, and that's ionizing radiation. And yet we treat brain cancer with ionizing radiation. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's an uh, uncomfortable paradox. Uh, and now we're actually treating some brain conditions with EMR, non-ionizing radiation. So it just seems uh, almost like it's, uh, the, the, the theory is being duplicated. And that is that you know, EMR can cause brain cancer. It can also treat brain cancer similar to ionizing radiation. And I think that's a very interesting phenomenon. Let me add something to that, because the, the NovoCure device, and there are other yeah. things out there, one of the things that may be happening is it affects post-mitotic spindle formation, which is what's involved in, in, in malignant cells reproducing. But another, there are other technologies recently in, in the pipeline and approved that use um, RF radiation to weaken membranes so you can enhance, enhance the delivery of chemotherapy. So clearly, if you can weaken membranes with radiofrequency radiation, yeah. how can you possibly assert that they have no negative effects? It, it's ludicrous. But just remember what Deborah said first of all, and that is that it is very difficult to uh, define what's actually ha happening when it comes to carcinogenic agents such as AMR. I mean, really, when it came to cigarette smoking, we had no idea of the mechanism. It was an association, clear association, for many, many decades before a mechanism was really uh, postulated. Um, I have two questions. What was it in 1997 that provoked Lloyd's to put in the exclusion? That's the first question. Second question is, have any studies been done on service personnel who were using radio during the war for hours on end, day after day, week after week, yep. etc.? Yep. Um, thank you. Um, I, I think you'll have to ask Lloyd's about 1997, but what I surmise or deduce is that the growing experimental literature at that point had become very robust. Uh, there was a, something called the Reflex Study in Europe, 15 laboratories, several million dollars, and it was designed to show there was no effect on brain cells from RF radiation. And I, I've, in my book, I talk about this. Uh, there's a chapter called The Doctor Who Danced with the Devil, about how he set this study up. He was convinced there was no problem. They started to get results showing it was damaging brain cells. So they went out and bought new equipment because they thought it must be an artifact. It's got to be a mistake. There's no way this weak radiation could be damaging the brain. After three times around, they finally concluded, oh, it does actually damage the brain. That was in 1997 or so. So the results started to come in. You've answered my question. All right. <laughs> I can't be sure, but I think that may have had something to do with it. In terms of the service personnel, there's not a month that goes by that I'm not asked to be an expert witness when it comes to some servicemen suing uh, his respective government for brain cancer. So it is very, uh, there's several class action lawsuits currently being run. Uh, I have several patients myself who were naval officers who spent 
hours and hours a day next to these big radar things. They felt the heat coming off them and they had brain right. cancer. So uh, the jury is out there, but it's uh, but Actually, it's Actually, I'm not, I, I'm not sure I would say the jury is out because I think there, there, there are some studies on testicular cancer for radar technicians. Cancer, yeah. And there may, there may be some studies now, brain cancer as well. So it's an excellent suggestion. But again, if we really want to know the answer, we've got to make a commitment to setting up the resources and the infrastructure to answer it. And it wouldn't be that hard. Let me give you an example. The Indians are doing a 5,000-person cross-sectional study. You could do it here in Australia. I hope that Uni Melbourne is going to be interested, and maybe you will be interested. Here's what you could do. You get 5,000 people who are of similar social class, and you just run them through all the standard clinical assays, CBC, sed rate, glucose, et cetera, et cetera, and sperm count, measures from the saliva of all kinds of things you can get of genotoxicity and cortisol and whatnot. And you get detailed billing records and information about cell phone use. And you organize them into high, medium, and low use. They're doing it in India. They've devoted the resources to it. And the preliminary results from one segment of it show severe hearing loss in the heaviest users. So you can, it can be done. It's a cross-sectional study. It doesn't take as long to crank through the data. It takes, it's a huge commitment. In the Indian government, they have more than 60 MDs on this study. I wonder sometimes if they're ever going to be able to publish it. But, the, but it's the kind of thing that can be done and should be done to answer your question. Um, <clears throat> a, a couple of questions from a friend of mine that can't be here. She was caught between two people piggybacking with Wi-Fi and became electro-hypersensitive electro and, got, and got quite ill. The first question is, is there any evidence that the blood-brain barrier can heal itself? I believe it gets damaged with EMF, etc. And my second question, um, well, maybe it's even from me. Uh, you were talking about your work on passive smoke in airplanes. She comes to stay with me. I don't use Wi-Fi. I have over 20 Wi-Fi networks beaming through my flat in a small block of flats. Wow. She's got a very sophisticated meter. The levels are quite astonishing. Wow. Um, and I don't see any difference between that. By the way, I'm a smoker, so I don't smoke. I don't, uh, you know, I've got to go and, and stand outside on sure. the main road to smoke. Right. Yet over 20 um, right. networks. And last but not least to everyone here... Um, my naughty cat sometimes turns on the Wi-Fi on my printer, which is more powerful as measured than a lot of your Wi-Fi routers. Yeah. But she's particularly interested in whether the blood-brain barrier can, can heal itself. What's the cat printing? Sorry? <laughs> no. <laughs> wow. Do you have any comments? Um, I don't know the data on it. Yeah. You know the data on no, no. The, the problem with electro-hypersensitivity is that there are a lot of bogus studies out there that claim there's no effect. And the studies are designed to fail. For example, they study people and they study them only for a short-term immediate effect, when in fact the effect can take hours or days to develop. Not everybody who's sensitive feels it right away. So it's, and there, again, uh, there's got to be a national commitment to serious investigation of this issue. There has to be. It's a scandal. The blood-brain barrier. I can answer that. Sure, of course you could. <laughs> Thank you. So the blood-brain barrier is a natural phenomenon that's designed to uh, prevent toxic uh, substances from crossing into the brain, which is very, very sensitive. So, in fact, most chemotherapeutic agents, in fact, can't be used for brain cancer because they're so toxic to the brain. We know we can break down the blood-brain barrier with certain agents. It's a drug called Diamox that will break it down. There are other agents that will break it down, like radiation, for example, ionising radiation. <clears throat> I am aware of one study that showed that the heat generated from a mobile phone broke do temporarily broke down the blood-brain barrier, uh, but it does have a reparative ability, so it can you know, get back to normal and be a normal blood-brain barrier. Let me ask you, um, there's some studies suggesting that mobile phone radiation is demyelinating. Mm. And, of course, you know, there are a number of diseases characterised by this. Um, have you any thoughts about that? Have you any of the observations? No, I saw that was, that was in uh, upstate New York, was it? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, look, 
I, I read the study. It, it wasn't, uh, I don't think, a very good study, and it hasn't been validated. So, no, I don't think it does cause, well, I don't know if it does cause demyelination. Okay. Um, hi, I'm a computer scientist and a teacher, and I'd like to make a comment and ask a question about Wi-Fi. Um, first of all, the comment, I'm very concerned that I've received the risk management form from the Department of Education in Victoria, which clearly says there is no risk of radiation, including microwaves, from iPads, even though I can clearly see that there is a risk noted in the um, instructions or user guide. So that's my comment. I'm very concerned. Um, my second thing is a question. In about 2009, the government in Australia rolled out the digital education revolution, which meant that there's a Wi-Fi access point in every high school learning area. Some six years later, our radiation authority is planning a measurement survey, not a health survey, a measurement survey. I would like to know what you think would be a good health survey that would be of good scientific value um, that would monitor the health of children. As more and more children in Australia are being exposed to Wi-Fi in schools, it's now filtered down to primary schools, and there are some three and a half million children, um, three and a half million students in Australian schools. So what do you think would be a good health survey on Wi-Fi? Well, first of all, the Israeli government with all the issues of what's going on in Israel now, has a national institute on non-ionizing radiation safety, and you can go to it for some information about this issue. They recommend, as, and so does the French, that there is no Wi-Fi at all in kindergarten and earlier, and they recommend limited Wi-Fi, and wherever possible, wired. The technological revolution is here. We want our children to know how to use these resources, but it can be wired and banks of wired computers can move from one room to another. You save the money as well. And there is no evidence, as you may know, that digital learning, wireless or wired, actually enhances cognition and retention of information. That has never been studied. We have been sold a bill of goods about the need for everybody to be techie. The Koreans are seriously concerned because they are seeing what they call digital dementia in middle school children, which is characterized by MRIs showing an underdevelopment of the right hemisphere, an overdevelopment of the left hemisphere, a lack of empathy in middle school kids. And think about this on a society-wide pattern. Children who do not have the ability to look you in the eye. And we see the results, the dreadful results, of people who do not have empathy in what happened in Paris. These are serious challenges for modern society today. And I think that the notion that there's no evidence on the dangers of Wi-Fi is, is simply wrong. And the government of Israel, the government of India, the government of Belgium have all expressed concerns about this. And I think what we need to do is to create an international summit where these other countries have taken <coughs> steps to protect their kids come together so that there's a free discussion of what's going on here. Uh, Deborah, I think we might have one more question. Right. And, well, and yeah. I think we should stay um, for more questions. Charlie, uh, recently um, a professor of public health at the University of Sydney uh, talked about breast, uh, uh, brain cancer rates staying stagnant from 1982 to 2011, which seems to contradict with some of the breast cancer data that. Uh, brain cancer oh, data that you've talked about case. today. Um, how does the public really decipher which data they need to listen to and how you do know, we, how I, we not yes. be confused by it, all of this? Of, of course, and let me explain. The professor is right if you look at it this way. And bear with me, I know the evening is late. If we look at the age-adjusted rate of brain cancer for everybody in the age distribution, okay, about 60% of all brain cancer occurs in people age 50 and over, right? That's the majority of brain cancers. And that age group is not now the age group with the, that were heavy cell phone users. They were not heavy cell phone users, those people. Yet they, they are still, the majority of cases are older. That's the age-adjusted rate. If you look at the age-specific rate, which is what Dr. Tio is starting to talk about, if you look at the young, kids 20 to 29, 30 to 39, in the United States today, 
we are seeing an increase in malignant brain tumors in that age group of people who were the heavier users of cell phone radiation. So you have to look at the age-specific rate, and you have to look at the type of tumor. There are more, more than 200 different subtypes of brain cancer, and if you start to slice and dice them, you can certainly make any increase you know, go away. But you're seeing increases in malignant glioma of the frontal and temporal lobe. Now, why would the frontal lobe and temporal lobe be relevant? Because if you wear glasses, metal glasses, that changes the exposure. Metal jewelry changes the exposure. And we don't have modeling of any of that. So yes, the brain cancer rate is flat when you look at that age-adjusted rate, because it's driven primarily, not exclusively, primarily by the older people. But the young is another story altogether. The Israeli Dental Association has issued a warning because one in five cases of a very rare malignant tumor, the parotid gland, is occurring in someone under the age of 20. Under 20. And they've issued a warning about mobile phones in children, because Israel at the time they did this was the heaviest user of these devices in the world. Um, so statistics are challenging. I've spent my life working on them. And the age-adjusted rate looks relatively flat, the age-specific rate is starting to show increases in certain types of tumors that we expect to be growing because of mobile phone radiation. And just finally, the largest data bank for brain cancer registration is the CB Trust, Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States. <coughs> it looks at, it doesn't include all 50 states, it's only 19 states, but it's still the largest bank that we have. And it showed an exponential increase in brain cancer incidence from 2004 to 2008. Uh, it's a little bit slow in coming out between 2012, 8 and 2012, but nevertheless the trend is upwards. And that was then shown also in the United Kingdom paediatric brain tumour database, which has also showed an increase in malignant brain tumours, especially ependymomas. Uh, so Britain, the United States, two very large uh, data banks have shown an increase, and Australia didn't. Uh, I'm not quite sure why our figures were different, but it could be well be because of what Deborah was saying. That is the way you just look at the statistics. But uh, the bottom line is I think most authorities do believe that the incidence is going up. But, you know, we're not going to see that huge exponential rise anyway until, of course, the latency period is seen. And the latency period for ionising radiation is very, very long. It's going to be just as long, if not longer, for non-ionising radiation. Do you really want to wait till the middle of this century before you have definitive proof of harm? before taking steps to prevent it? I don't think so. I mean, I think we've reached enough maturity as a civilization that we can say, let's look at the evidence before us now, and let's take steps now to protect ourselves, rather than insisting on proof that enough people have become sick that all the rest of you and your children and your grandchildren will have been doomed. We can do better, and I'm really delighted to be here tonight because I think we started something that I hope will continue and develop in something very positive for Australia and for the world. Deborah, as I move a vote of thanks on behalf of everybody here, um, I, I just wanted to point out that Deborah's actually here on a holiday, would you believe it? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well. so, thank, thanks to Dr. T.O. for joining the discussion this evening and thank you Deborah for your talk this evening. I think we've all enjoyed the experience immensely so thank you and good luck on your journey.